I uh, welcome you here to this talk, uh, which is going to be rather an impromptu presentation. I have some things here that I've got on a PowerPoint. So uh, it came, this talk came to me kind of uh, at the last minute. But I must say it's something that I've always been thinking about. When you explore these ancient texts, these ancient Sanskrit texts, you enter into another world of thinking. You, in order to do it properly, you have to go into the mindset of the author. You have to enter into his world. And that means you have to try desperately to bracket out your own world view, your own understanding of things, to try to understand their way of thinking. So my, my task has been to struggle with that. How do I enter into the mindset of these ancient peoples, these ancient Indian people, the people who were responsible for composing the Vedic texts? Uh, and then entering into it not to hear the hymns so much or not to understand so much the way in which they understood religious things, but how did they understand what we call science, in particular medicine, healing. Because healing is something that is universal. All human beings fall sick, uh, become injured, and all human beings want to remove this suffering from themselves. And various people have done it in various ways throughout time. Uh, we in the West have developed a particular mode of dealing with that, which, uh, whether one wants to admit it or not, is the preferred mode for healing today. But other people didn't quite see it that way, especially the Vedic people, the, the, the most ancient of the Indian people. They saw it in a different way. So the, the quest is, the, the the uh, challenge, if you will, is can I understand these people's mode of thinking from the perspective that I am in today? I mean, is, the, is there really science in the Veda in the sense that we understand science? I would have to say categorically not. No. But can we go in and understand what they understood to be science. This is, this is really the challenge you have to find yourself, you put yourself in. And if that's the case, then one can say, yes, there is science in the Veda, but it's a particular kind of science. And it should not be a method of understanding that is foreign to us or is something that we cannot get a hold of because we ourselves are steeped in this Western style of scientific thinking which is based on this scientific method that we all learned, especially people here in this field. But I remember as a, as a young boy studying in grammar school, we learned the scientific method, where you make observation, you formulate questions, then the hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, and then you gather data and you, re you construct some kind of experiment to test your data. And then if that doesn't fail, you go back and you refine it. For me, I was always caught in this circle of having to refine the hypothesis to try to get some results. But then it goes, then you make general theories based on your data, and then it goes again around and around. So this is the mode of thinking that we have been taught. This is science. Nothing else is science. Nothing will pass for science unless we put ourselves and work with that model. 
And then if we want to say, okay, that model is fine, we know it, but are there other models, other ways of conceiving the world and understanding it in a scientific way that may be out there that are worth looking at, if not just for the sake of curiosity. How did people before this time, how did they think? How did they get on in the world? How did they get through life? I mean, we have our own challenges here, and they had the same challenges, the same problems. So we haven't gotten very far in that regard. Just the ways in which we deal with it. You know, there are more technology, there's more this, there's more that. There's all sorts of things that come in and attack you and do things to, to make you feel better in the, in the medical realm. To make life easier by all sorts of machines and gadgets. This is something, an observation my wife and I had while we were here. We were watching one day the people here on campus and there were all sorts of people doing all sorts of different things. Collecting this, doing that, doing uh, what we would call physical manual things. Cleaning the road by sweeping it, hand sweeping it. We thought, geez, this would never, ever, ever happen in Denmark, where I come from. Instead of 10 people cleaning the road, there would be one person driving in a machine who would clean it. And we thought, well, okay, that's nice, that's fine. But what about these 10 people? How are they going to make a living? How are they going to eke out an existence if they could not simply do some work and earn, earn, a, earn a, a, a wage? Not only to earn the wage, but feel themselves that I'm doing something with my life. I'm doing something. I'm making an improvement. I'm contributing to the welfare of my family, my children. Rather than saying, okay, look at how easy I have made life by putting this machine and driving it along. One person, he gets one wage and his family goes and lives well. Here in India, 10 people can have that feeling of I'm doing something good for my family and my life. What's wrong with that? Is that so bad? It's not the most advanced technologically. It doesn't have this machine that's doing the work for me. So the question is, is it always the, the best for human beings to have advanced technological gadgets and gizmos that make life easier? Maybe not. Maybe there's a model here. Maybe there's a lesson to be learned by giving more people the opportunity to feel good than fewer people. I don't, that just came to my mind in relationship to this. So we have this scientific method that lets all these machines do everything for us. Uh, and this is the way we're thought. This is the way we we're put into our mind, and that's how we think. But is that what the Veda is all about? First of all, the Veda, when you talk about the Veda, there are various ideas of what is the Veda. Uh, officially speaking, from the point of view of uh, the literature, the Veda is cons uh, consists of the Samhitas, Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, and the Tarva Veda, the Brahmanas, and the Upanishads, the early Upanishads, which are known as the Vedanta, the end of the Veda. This is it. Nothing else usually will pass in the academic, the scholarly, the Brahmanic, the real Pukka Brahmanic circles. But in this Veda, something comes up that allows us to see two particular worldviews that can help us understand the way these people think. The first worldview is based on 
the both of them are based on myths of creation. Uh, the way in which the world was put together is fundamental to our understanding of the world. We in the West, who are brought up in the Judeo-Christian religion, we're taught that the God created the world in six days. The seventh day was given to rest. Hence, we have a week of seven days. We cannot think of a week in any other way than seven days. You can't have an eight-day week, a ten-day week. You can only have a seven-day week. Why? Because it's part of our myth of creation, simply. The same thing applies here in the Vedic worldview through the myths of creation. The first one is based on a sacrificial model in which the world was conceived of being created through the sacrifice of a cosmic person. It's interesting because sacrifice of a person, were they thinking also in terms of human sacrifice? Perhaps. Perhaps they were. But this is how the worldview comes together based on that myth. And I'll just read part of it so you understand. When they divided the man into how many parts did they divide him, sacrifice him? What was his mouth? What was his arms? What were his thighs, his feet? The Brahman caste was the mouth. Of his arms was made the warrior, Kshatriya. His thighs became the Vaishya, and his feet became the Sudra. So here, in this myth of creation, we have the forecast. Pure and simple, from higher to lower. The mouth higher up on the person, the higher the Shudra being the feet, they're lowest to the ground, so they're the lowest. That's the way it is, that's how it was. God created it that way, that's how it was. The moon rose from his mind, from his eyes was born the sun, from his mouth Indra and Agni, from his breath the wind was born, from his navel came air, from his head there came the sky, from his feet the earth, the four quarters from his ear, thus they fashioned the world. So here through this sacrifice the cosmos was created. With sacrifice to God, sacrifice to sacrifice, whatever that means. These were the first of the sacred laws. These mighty beings reached the sky where are the eternal, eternal spirits, the gods. So here we have in this myth of creation, basic, the social order for Indians to follow, Hindu Indians to follow, the way the cosmos was put together, and so forth. You cannot think of it in any other way. In the same way we cannot create an eight-day week, you cannot create a seven-cast system. It just doesn't exist. It's there, and it's part of our being. And this then structures the way in which the world has evolved. But there's another myth of creation that I really think brings about something, another spark of thinking that leads to another whole realm of understanding that I think we can identify with today. And this myth of creation is known as the hymn of creation in the same book, the late 10th book, 10th mandala of the Rig Veda. And it represents a mind that is not locked into a particular mode of thinking, but one that is inspired to think out of the box, as it were. And this is a beautiful hymn, I think, one of, the, one of my most favorites. Then even nothingness was not, nor existence. There was no air then nor the heavens beyond it. What covered it? Where was it? In whose keeping? Was there then cosmic water in depths unfathomed? Then there was neither death nor immortality, 
nor was there then the torch of night and day. The one breathe windlessly and self-sustaining. How can you breathe windlessly? There was that one then, and there was no other. At first there was only darkness wrapped in darkness. All this was only unilluminated water. That one which came to be enclosed in nothing arose at last, born of the power of heat. In the beginning, desire descended on it. That was the primal seed, born of the mind, born of the mind. The sages who have searched their heart with wisdom know what is, is kin to that which is not. And they have stretched their cord across the void and know what was above and what below. Seminal powers made fertile, mighty forces. Below was strength, above was impulse. But after all, who knows? Who can say whence it all came and how creation happened? The gods themselves are later than creation. So who knows truly whence it has arisen, whence all creation had its origin, he, whether he fashioned it or whether he did not, he who surveys it all from the highest heaven, he knows, or maybe even he does not know. What kind of mind created this poetry? What was going on here in this person's mind at the same time that this stable sacrificial system was there? Here, I think, we begin to see the seeds of what could possibly be a scientific mode of thinking. Scientific in this sense, not in our sense but in something else going on here. So I think we begin to see that there's some spark, a nuance of something going on here that is going to give rise to something new, something quite extraordinary. The whole idea of heat, the whole idea of of, of separating things into two, above and below, male, female, these kinds of things. This was in the mind of the person. And it stemmed from what? It stemmed from probably observation. Observing the world around. Not taking things for granted, but actually observation. And herein, I think, lies the seeds of what is the Vedic science, and that is observation, what we call empiricism. Not accepting things, but actually looking at it, going out there and looking at things. What's really going on here? What, 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 what's happening here? And this, I think, we begin to see here in this Indian mind. We have in medicine, we have the Vedic and the Ayurvedic. The Ayurvedic comes to us as a kind of full-blown ideological system where you have the three doshas. Before that, we have nothing of that. We have a system of healing that's based on uh, magic. We would call magic. Where there are demons that populate the world, they come and attack us, so we need to remove them. We need to remove them. And we do that through, through, through rituals and through hymns and through different kinds of chanting and, and uh, applying of, of uh, amulets and potions and things like that. But one thing comes out of this process that, again, reflects this kind of observation that goes on here. And it's found in a hymn 
because I don't have it with me here, I have to use my computer to get it. And it's a hymn to the demon Tukman. Tukman, who is very, very popular uh, disease demon in the Atarva Veda. And it's dealt with in different ways, but in, in terms of describing this disease, I think something is rather revealing. And I'll just read a little bit of it. Uh, you, O Tuckman, accompanied with your brother a swelling, your sister a cough, and your evil cousin a rash, depart to the distant tribe. So the idea is to remove it from the person and send it to somebody else, namely the, the undesirable, the, the warriors, the other tribe that's always hounding this tribe. Destroy, O plant, the one that's waving over the person, that Tuckman which recurs every third day, who has the third day free who is continual, who is, occurs in the autumn, who is both hot and cold, and who arises in the summer and in the rainy season. Again. Obeisance to the very hot, shaking, driving, violent, Obeisance to the chilly, cold Tuckman, who brings about the previous desire for rain. Let the unruly Tuckman who approaches daily, in two days, go unto the frog. What is all this occurring every third day, every fourth day, continually shivering, cold, what is he talking about here? Anybody? What is that demon? Comes with the rains. It's some kind of a fever, no? Probably something related to malaria. What's interesting here, we don't, they didn't know what malaria was. They didn't know when malaria came with the mosquito and so on and so on. But they were observing what happens to that patient. They were observing and recording it, right? It happens, it comes every day, every other day, once, just like malarial fever does. So they were recording for the first time the symptoms for this fever. Again, the power of observation and recording the observation. In the anatomical world, we have a very sophisticated anatomical explanation in human beings that comes in primarily the Ayurvedic literature, but it goes back to the Vedic literature where when they cut the sacrificial animal, right? They cut the legs, they cut this, they cut the arms, they cut this. And every time they cut a piece of the sacrificial animal, what did they do? They had a ball of rice, they threw it into the fire, and they recited that part again and again and again. So that these anatomical parts then became enumerated. And they remembered it because it was part of this process of throwing it in the fire. So the constant process of enumeration of what we could call samkhya, the counting, the 24 tattvas, the, the five of this, the six of that, Buddhist literature, is completely full of these things. The fives, the fours, the six, the tens, the 32 marks, 
the 80 mining marks, all these numbers begin to become part of the thinking process. Enumeration, observation combined with enumeration begins to put together the seeds, the beginning of the Vedic mind of science. We can all recall the famous mathematician Ramanujan here, who had a supernatural ability to compute. Compute astronomical numbers in the mind. And how did he do it? He just said, the goddess brought it to me. It came to me instantaneously. How that works, I don't really know. But again, it's kind of part of this, this penchant, this, this early Indian penchant to enumerate, to observe things, to make sense out of it, to put it into categories, and to enumerate is the beginning of the Indian scientific mind, as I see it. And then later, we have more sophisticated forms that come out, uh, namely the use of measurements, uh, which is not part of the Vedic literature itself, but an ancillary part of the Vedic literature known as the sutras or the Shulba sutras, the sutras that talk about measuring with a cord. Remember we saw in that one hymn, they stretched the cord across the way. So there's some kind of measuring activity that goes on. And what did they do? What did they measure? They measured the bricks to make the fire altar, this fire altar in the form of a big bird. How did they do that? How did they do that so that it came out the same each and every time. Well, they use numbers, they use measurement, they use repetition again and again, so that each brick had its place and they were able to measure it so that you can see here in this schematic how they were able then to record and make this all important fire altar for the Vedic sacrifice each and every time. So we see here the, the beginnings of a mindset that begins to develop. And I would say here in, in India that, that in many ways this computational mindset, this categorization mindset is part of what we might call the Indian genetic code because it, it's very, very prevalent in many, many Indian scientists of note. So, I conclude by saying, can we call this science? Can we call this process of thinking, this thinking out of the box, enumeration, uh, quantification, and uh, uh, observation? If so, what? kind of science would it be? And I stop here and open it up to discussion now.